Yeah, it was so good. It was so good. And you're going to not just have this only on a Sunday morning. You're going to do that for the next 40 days. We're going to launch it this 40 days, this Friday, 40 days prayer and fasting. Some of you, I think just now when Joel asked, you already put up your hands. That's marvelous. You're already praying. But do come. Pray together as a church. You could see the whole spiritual atmosphere will shift. Amen. 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 And it's really great that some of you have already started praying. Well done. Well done. And fasting at the same time. That's really great. You never know how much God is doing behind the scenes until you really start fasting and praying. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray and commit this time to the Lord. Father, we want to thank you for yet another opportunity to praise you, to marvel at your wonderful works that surround us, Father God. We pray, Father, Lord, as we come and consider what you would do in our lives, how much it matters, Father, when you are invited into each and every life, that your marvelous presence really makes that great a change, Father. So we want to commit this time into your hands as we consider your word, Father, that you would intervene and put in words that are not mine, Father God, that each one of your people will listen and they would know that it's you speaking, Father God. And Lord, I pray to Father, that you will interrupt me if there are words that I should not have said, Father God. Lord, I want to commit this time into your hands, thanking you as we all sit beneath the shadow of a cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is just working all the time, everywhere. He sometimes He reveals Himself in all His glory, at other times He just does it quietly behind the scene. Just like what He did in this story I heard. There was this pastor of a neighbouring church who decided on a bright and sunny Sunday morning, not like this, it was raining, thank God for the refreshing morning, but on a bright and sunny Sunday morning, he decided he wants to play golf. He used to be crazy about golf before he gave it all up for the Lord. But that morning, he had the itch. So what did he do? He pretended he was sick, and he got his deputy pastor to run the service for him. And then he went and drove 80 kilometers out of KL to a golf course that he knew he wouldn't meet any of his church members. <laughs> and then when he reached there, and at first tee, he found that the whole golf course was deserted. There was no one in sight. It's as if everyone was sleeping or in church. So, watching all this from heaven, Angel Gabriel leaned to the Lord and asked the Lord, are you going to let him get away with this? Just then, the pastor swung the golf club and hit the ball, and the ball went up into the air, but it went straight for the water trap. But as he reached near the water trap, the water parted, and the ball fell in the muddy bottom, but it bounced up on the opposite side, and he rolled across, hit the tree stump, and when he hit the tree stump, the squirrel came out, and he took up the ball and ran across the lawn with the ball. And as he ran across the lawn, away from the hole, an eagle swooped out of nowhere, picked the, eagle, the squirrel and the ball up, and he went up into the air towards the pin. As he reached above the pin, there was a zap of lightning, and he up, pom! And it was in a ball of fur and feathers, the eagle and the squirrel evaporated, and the ball dropped straight down into the hole. Pook! A hole in one! Wow! It was a fantastic hole in one! The pastor was so excited, it was a hole in one. Astonished, the angel Gabriel asked the Lord, Lord, why do you do all this for him? The Lord smiled and replied, Who is he going to tell? <laughs> I'm sure that day the pastor learned more than a golf lesson. <laughs> but it's also assuring to know that the Lord watches over all his pastors. Amen? <laughs> Often, we do not see what God is doing behind the scene. But when God intervenes, it's always for your own good. Yeah? Tell your neighbor, when God intervenes, it's always for good. Come on, you don't seem convinced. Those at the back and up there has not said, okay, you're not convinced. Let's have a look at the scripture. Let's turn to the book of Acts. This portion of scripture clearly tells us about God's intervention. Yeah? If you read me, if you've got a Bible, it's good to open up, it's good to bring out your tablet. Yeah, it used to belong to Moses carrying tablets, but nowadays we all have our tablets with God's Word. <laughs> Reading from Acts chapter 12, verse 1. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. 
So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Peter has an impetuous nature. He's brash, and sometimes he says things that he shouldn't have said. So maybe because of that, another leader has arisen, James. Perhaps even a stronger leader than Peter. But the evil forces, namely Harold, saw, and he interrupted it. He had James arrested and executed. And then Peter was put in prison. What has initially started as a successful God-initiated movement seemed to have met a setback when both the leaders, the major leaders, were gone. James killed and Peter now in prison under heavy guard. Now, how many of us know that Peter's in deep trouble with not just one or two, but 16 guards watching over him? Let's continue reading what happened. From verse 6, the night before Harold was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and the light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side, woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrist. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and the second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. God intervenes in times of difficulty. Peter was in a very difficult situation. He was put into prison. He was put in the chains with two guards right next to him. It was an impossible situation. There was no way out. He was destined for certain death, as many would put it. But God intervened. God sent his angel and set Peter free out of captivity into freedom. And that was a miraculous intervention by God. When that happened, he was set out of physical imprisonment. But nowadays, the many imprisonments are not necessarily physical. Many of us, perhaps even some of us here today, came into this hall being captive by the things in our life. It could be sickness, it could be a financial bondage, it could be an addiction, or maybe even family crisis they are writing, or perhaps some personal issues like bitterness, anger, offences that have bound you all these years and you just cannot let go of it. We may be captives to many other things. As God has intervened to set Peter free from this captivity, he could do the same for you out of your captivity. Amen? God delivers out of miraculous situations. I've seen it personally myself. God delivers us out of sickness. There was this lady, in fact, a couple, young couple with a small child who had eczema for years, and they, they came one day asking the church to pray earnestly for this, this young girl, and she had been covered head to toe with rashes, and sometimes, believe me, it can get dangerous, and she could die from it. The church prayed, and within two days, the eczema just disappeared. And I remember pastor was sharing and the couple was sitting there. It was a real life incident. And not only in acute cases, God even intervenes in chronic cases like cancer, that so many have been healed of cancer. Not only out of sickness, God delivers people out of financial crisis that runs into millions. There is a brother that God has walked through in this church itself. This financial crisis, and today he's in church with us too. God also delivers people out of addiction. I personally have interviewed and talked to brothers who have been addicted to cigarette smoking and some pornography. And they said for years they've been trying to get rid of it, but when God intervened and touched their life, it became something which transformed them. They said they have, these things have no more appeal to them. More than that, there was this brother who is in East Malaysia. Once he was a drug addict, he was a drug pusher. He was actually enticing young people to come into drug abuse. And God touched him in East Malaysia. 
He came over to West Malaysia and today is serving as a leader in the Bahasa ministry. Praise God for that. Not only God delivers out of addiction, even then in family crisis, out of a apparent divorce that's going to happen, to a couple, husband and wife, came from Kuantan to Kuala Lumpur to sign divorce papers. And on that, they came on a weekend. So being a weekend, the husband's friend, the wife's friend, invited both of them independently to come to church. And they were in our other church, SMCC. That service, they both attended, sitting in separate parts of the church. That service, the Lord touched their lives. They came to accept the Lord and they became reconciled after that. Imagine that, that God intervenes even when they were not even Christians, that God knows what you need in your heart even before you utter it, that the Holy Spirit will intervene for you in groans that are too deep for understanding, that God does that. And our pastor, our family pastor, Steve, uh, Stanley and Irene, and even the prayer counseling team will testify there's so many individuals who have come with personal issues and through God's intervention in their life, through our pastors and the prayer counselling team, God transformed them around. That they were in despair, they were in, the, in depression, and God turned them around. Praise God for that. That God intervenes miraculously in so many situations, even today, that He does it. That for God, nothing is impossible. Amen? Amen. God intervenes in our moments of difficulty. He does that. For even the scripture says, as His grace is sufficient for you, for His power is made perfect in your weakness. That His power is made perfect in your weakness. That at the point where you really need and you don't know where to turn to, God is always there. He's always there. When God intervenes, it's always for good. When God intervenes, it's always for good. Amen? You may not understand, it may sound funny, it may sound odd at the time when God intervenes, but when He does, it's always for good. But what is it that draws God's attention to you? What is it that attracts God to you, that activates God's intervention in your life? I put it to you, there are three areas that will draw God's attention and draw God's intervention into your life. The first is prayer. The second is, uh, sorry, um, pursuit. And the third is proclamation. Prayer, pursuit, and proclamation. Can you repeat out of me? Prayer, Prayer. pursuit, Pursuit. proclamation. Good, it helps me to remember. (laughs) Okay, great. Prayer, pursuit, and proclamation. What is it that draws people, that draws God to you? Let's look at prayer. Yep. Even as, as Peter was being imprisoned, the Holy Spirit has already moved the church to pray earnestly for him. We read that in verse 5. But not only just during that time, whenever we pray, nothing moves God's hand as much as when the saints pray. In Revelation 8 verse 4, it says the prayer of the saints is like incense arising before the throne of God continually, not just one prayer, but as all the saints pray, especially when the church, a whole nation would have prayed. Just now we were, during the worship, we were saying, pray together for the nation. When the nation prays, the prayer of the saints rise continuously before God. Amen. And that, that encourages, that interests God, that really moves God's hand. Not that we can move His sovereignty, but God is attracted and He takes pleasure and delight in the prayers. Of his people. Amen? When Peter was in prison, the church prayed. But what happened when pre- Peter was being released? Let's have a look a little bit further down in verse 12. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary and the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. When Peter was released, the church was still praying. You know, they, they, it's not just one instance that the church is praying. Throughout the book of Acts, from the time the Pentecost came, even before Pentecost, when Jesus left the disciples, telling them to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit, they were already praying. 
and through the prayer, the Holy Spirit enlightened them and they knew who else to replace Judas. And then after that, they were praying for the coming of the Holy Spirit and when it came, they continued praying. They met together, thousands were added and they had fellowship and they were praying together. And it went on and on and it, throughout the whole book of Acts, if you do a word search, there were 34 times that the word pray, the root word pray, either it's in praying, prayer or prayed, appeared 34 times now. The early church, the first church, is a praying church. Amen? It's a praying church. And when the church prays together, it attracts God's intervention into their lives. And you could see signs and wonders and all that. It just didn't come. Just by it, because God was so pleased to release signs and wonders because when they prayed, they moved the hand of God. Amen? But what? Thank you very much. Thank you for the encouragement. I'm so glad. <laughs> I'm so glad. It would be wonderful if you all would say that too. Amen? <laughs> Praise God. All right. You know, what happens when the church prays earnestly? The first thing that happens is a shift in the spiritual atmosphere. The spiritual atmosphere in a land that's without God's people, in, in, in a land that nobody's praying, it's like a dark cloud that's over the land. We don't see it because when we don't open our spiritual eyes, we don't see it. But it's like a dark cloud that's over the land. And it just casts a shadow over the land. But when it prays, it's just like Jacob in his dream at Bethel. When he, in his dream, he saw an open heaven. It's like the dark clouds had been pushed aside and there's a pathway. And in Jacob's dream, he saw the angels ascending and descending on the ladder. That when it prays, when we pray, God intervenes. And when God intervenes, He activates angelic activity. Amen? And this angelic activity is that which set Peter free. It's that which when the, angelic, the angel came under the direction, the orders of God, he set them free. He set Peter free. Angelic activity brings about a remarkable outcome, a miraculous outcome, outcome that you will not expect. But you, as people of God, should learn to expect it because it is your portion. You are called by God to be His people, His ambassadors, to be the praying church. Amen? We are going into this 40 days prayer and fasting. We have done it. Some of you may say we have done it in previous years. Yes, I've seen. But in previous years, yes, there were miracles that happened. People were struggling with bondages and they had breakthroughs over these previous years, 40 days prayer and fasting. There were so many testimony. So you would think probably it's another one. But this time, this 40 days prayer and fasting is going to culminate in E16. All right, E16. It's both a seminar and a night festival. But it is not an end to itself. That is a movement of God, right? So when we pray towards it, when you engage yourself, just now, Joel was asking for how many people to participate in it? 3,000 people. Now, 3,000 people. Our church has three services. Each, services, each service about 1,000 attend. So 3,000 would involve all of you, right? Yeah, every one of you, right? So go tell the neighbour, he's talking about you. Right? So when you engage in prayer, all of us engage in prayer, you will see a shift in the spiritual atmosphere that not only people will have breakthroughs, not only people will come. You will find that the neighbour will start slowly. That for years you've been asking them to come and they will start coming to church. They will find that the people that you talk to in a coffee shop, personally I've met someone who was so amazing that, well, I, I don't know the person, he just sat in a coffee shop together with me and when we started engaging in conversation, we found out that it was the leader, it was the brother of a cell leader, and he has not come to church for years. And then God just engages together. The Holy Spirit prompted us. God intervened and we brought him and we had communion together in hospital for a sister who had cancer. And we were praying for the sister. Out of a chance meeting? Accident? No, through God's intervention. It was divine appointment. So when you pray together, this is what's going to happen. Amen? Amen. And you see that happening over again. It's going to be a revival, as Pastor puts it. We're going to see people turn 180 degrees back to God. Revival basically means people who do not know God, people who rebel against God, people who do not acknowledge God, just turn 180 degrees, coming back to God. Amen? Amen. And that's what we are praying for, a revival moment. The praying church during that time activated God's intervention. They brought about angelic activity that set captives free. But it also did one other thing. It also pushed back the dark forces, the forces of oppression. 
We find it also in a bit further down in the same chapter in Acts 12. Reading from verse 21. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, This is the voice of a God, not of a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to increase and spread. Hallelujah! That the word, that, the, the, that when God intervenes and He sends His angels, the angels not only set captives free, the same, the very same angelic force pushed back the force of oppression, which was Herod. The very same angelic force struck down Herod, who was, the, he is an epitome of evilness in that land. He's an icon that stood up for evil and oppression. And it was struck down in God's presence. That is the power of a church praying earnestly. Hallelujah. Church, would you join in these prayers of an earnest church? Yeah? That when you join in, you would see that the forces of darkness that stood itself against God will be laid low. That souls who are in captivity will be set free. That the truth of the Lord, the truth of the Lord will be proclaimed everywhere you go. And you will find boldness and courage to do that. And you will find that the revival is in the making. Amen? Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord for that. We need, we need everyone, every one of you, both individually and corporately, to come together to pray in the homes, in the church, as well as come together, even in the national prayer altar, to pray for this land. Just now it was so good when we prayed together for the nation that we would humble ourselves and pray. It is not a mere say. I'm not just here marketing for what the senior leadership has said to do. It is something which is from the scripture. It is something from my heart. I believe that things move, seriously move when we pray, when we let God, when we begin to see God moving. It's only when we pray. Amen? But prayer is important. I remember Pastor Philip was saying, he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and he prayed in 1998 in Canada, but nothing moved because everyone prayed, but nobody was willing to move. So there must be something else that attracts, the, that activates God's intervention besides prayer. What else is there? Looking at Peter's character, he comes across as a man who is authentic, who is genuine. There's no two ways about him. Chinese call it yat yi. One is one, two is two, okay? He, he's just being genuine. He may be brash, he may, he may be someone who speaks his mind and doesn't mince his word. That's why he earned the, the, the infamy of being called the man with the foot in the mouth. But then, he was also the same person that when the Lord Jesus was arrested, he not was arrested. When the Lord Jesus asked, who do you think I am? He was the one that proclaimed in Matthew 16, 16, that you are the Messiah, that you are the Son of the living God. But the rest of the disciples thought that Jesus was a prophet or maybe perhaps John the Baptist. His, he has this urge, his urgent, urgency and the desire to be with Jesus is unparalleled. He is constantly with the Lord Jesus. one of the closest disciples that Jesus confided in. Yes, he may be brash, he may be, he may be loud, but he's the one, the only disciple that followed Jesus into the temple courts. He denied Jesus three times. Yes, he's a man of character flaw, but he never gave up. He never gave up. His pursuit of Jesus was superb. He just followed the Lord everywhere he went, even after Jesus died. And when he was resurrected, Peter was the first to rush into the tomb, even past John, because John hesitated, and he went in to look for Jesus. When he was in the boat, when Jesus called him from the shore, he was the first to jump in and swim to the shore to his master's side and, and say to the Lord and speak to the Lord, Lord, it is really you. And then when he was restored, there was no end to what God could, drew, could do through Peter. He just rose from spiritual height to spiritual height. You could see that even from the Pentecost itself, he stood up boldly, he preached, he 
spoke boldly, he testified upon Jesus in his life, not even worried about authorities. And in the whole of the book of Acts, you could see signs and wonders that God has done through Peter, that he, he could even he could heal, he, he, he prophesied, and even as he walked past someone, his shadow could even heal the person. He gave glory to Jesus over and over again, proclaiming Jesus wherever he went. And when that happened, you delighted God no end. And God continued to pour and intervene in his life over and over again, pouring out the spiritual gifts into Peter. There is something in Peter that attracts God, that attracts God intervention. Amen? It is a fitting end that we read in Acts chapter 12 that we hear of Peter's name mentioned in every chapter from Acts 1 to 12, except 6 and 7, where it speaks of Stephen. But from chapter 13 onwards, Peter fades away, and then Paul takes over. It points us to the fact that God considered Peter as a very important person to establish his very first church, his early church. But it is a good close, a fitting close to a chapter in Peter's life. That it was this miraculous set free out of captivity that shows glo God's glorious triumph of God's intervention in Peter's life. Amen? God does amazing things. But at the end of the day, you must want to pursue God. You must want to pursue God. God looks into our hearts. It is not about coming to church on time. It's not about only about attendance, or it's not about serving or which church you go to. It is when you pursue God wholeheartedly, that's when God intervenes in your life. You know, in Jeremiah 29 verse 12, the Lord says, You will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your when you seek me with all your heart, the Lord says, God looks into your heart. So when you pursue the Lord, pursue Him with all your heart. How many of you have heard of Lou Engel? Lou Engel? Only just a few in the front. Up there, nobody has heard of Lou Engel. Wow, the knowledge only settles down here. It's more anointed to sit down here you know, next time. Yeah, Lou Engel. How many of you have heard of Azusa now? I'm looking up in the balcony. Ah, there's a few up there. Well done, well done. Yeah, a few of you down here too. You've heard of Azusa now. Azusa now is actually held on the 110th anniversary of the Azusa Street Revival. It was held in LA, Los Angeles. Okay? Now, Lou Engel, just to tell you a little bit about him, is a Christian evangelist. He's in his 60s now. In his younger years, he, he gave up his career to be a pastor, and then subsequently he went on to become an evangelist. He was involved in the 70s and 80s in the, what we call the Jesus Movement. You probably won't have it here because mainly in America. But this is where we encourage young people to come together and to go out into the streets, into the colleges, into the schools, into the marketplace, into wherever they are in the workplace to share the gospel. And hundreds and thousands came to know the Lord. And then subsequently, he was in, he's founded The Call. The Call is where they gather the people together in bigger places, in rallies of revival, rallies of evangelism. Again, thousands came to know the Lord. In every season of his life, he had this wholehearted pursuit of God. And he never gave it up. Now in his 60s, a few years ago, he had only one thing in his possession, his house. He never owned anything much. He gave all he had to God because of his pursuit for God. But three years ago, he heard a call from God. He heard a call from God through a dream, subsequently confirmed through revelation and prophecy, and even the word from other people. To answer this call, to hold this event called Azusa Now. And they had a problem. It was to be held in the Los Angeles Olympic Stadium, a stadium big enough to, to really the biggest gathering of Christians and non-Christians together. Where could they hold it? And he found this Olympic Stadium, and he knew that was a place, but they had not enough funds to do it. And it is this ardent pursuit for God. He knew that he had to do one thing, to sell his house, to sell his house for it. And he sold his house. And Azusa now has happened on the 9th of April, 2016. On that day, 
75,000 people or more even crowded into the stadium, filling up the whole stadium. And there were people from all races, from the, blacks community, the black community, the white community, from Asia, and even Korean pastors flew over. And there were the red Indian Christians who came. And they were praying together. There was unity. There were signs and wonders. There were healing. There were prophecies being even said. And it was caught on camera. There was a prophet who was down there sharing. And someone up there in the stands said yes. And he said there's someone up there. And it confirmed exactly what it was said. It was caught on camera. If you want to look at it, live stream, look at Google as you saw now, live stream. You can see it for yourself. And this was all happening. People came in view chairs and walked out of the stadium, leaving the view chair there. That, when someone pursues God wholeheartedly, God intervenes that day. And when He intervened, He intervened in a magnified area. The more you devote your life to God, God loves and delights in intervening in your life that so many were touched that day. Thousands were saved that day. Praise the Lord for that. Give glory to God for that. Hallelujah. And we are looking towards something like that. E16 is going to be something like that. When you pray, when you pursue God wholeheartedly, you will see God moving. You will see God intervening in your life in a marvellous, fantastic way. Amen? You must want to pursue God. You must want to pursue God. Lou desired revival in his lifetime. Lou Engel desired to see the kingdom of God established in his lifetime. He wants to answer the call of God upon his life. This one call of God upon his life. In an interview leading up to Azusa Street, it was actually recorded. And the interviewer asked him, why? Why do you do that? Why do you give up the only possession you have? And he said the Lord spoke to him in a word that from the scripture, he said, when he was asking the Lord how to provide the funds, the Lord told him, Matthew 13, verse 44, that the kingdom of God is like a treasure in a field. When a man found it, he hid it, and in all his joy, he sold all he had and bought the field. He literally took God's word at its value. He sold all he had and he bought the field because he knew that the treasure that he so desire is the pleasure and delight of God as he obeys God's call. He knew that the joy and intimacy of knowing Jesus is far greater worth than any treasure on earth. And he pursued it with all his might. Amen? Amen. You must want to pursue God like Peter did. You must want to pursue God like Lou Engel did. When Peter was released from prison, what was the first thing that Peter did? Did he go for a holiday? Or maybe perhaps take a cruise so it became Peter's first missionary journey? Nope, it's not recorded there. Did he go back to start preaching and teaching and, and, and started another era, another season of his ministry? No, it's not recorded there. Did he go out to the nearest golf course, played a round of golf and did his first swing and landed the first hole in one? Nope, it's not recorded. Perhaps maybe golf wasn't even invented then. But no, that was not what Peter did. What did Peter do? In verse 12, in verse 16, Peter kept on knocking and when they opened the door, they saw him. They were astonished. But Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the brothers about this, he said. And then he left for another place. The first thing he did was to tell the brethren. But is this just his first off? He was so excited that he was released from jail that he went to tell the brethren? No. That is Peter's nature. That's in Peter's nature to tell of the brethren. Even when the Spirit came upon him at Pentecost, the first thing he did was to stand up in the front of the masses in Jerusalem to tell people of every race his testimony about the Lord Jesus. The proclamation of the testimony of the Lord in his life. And then he went on. He kept on telling others about the Lord Jesus. And then until the authorities were so fed up of him that in Acts chapter 4, we hear of the Sanhedrin, the rulers of the day. They were practically ruling the land. And they called him up, Peter and John. And he questioned them. You know, why are you telling about Jesus and all that? But he said, no. Is it wrong to obey God rather than men? He asked them back. And they had no answer for that. They released them. And again, in Acts chapter 5, we read, they were hauled again before the Sanhedrin one more time. And they were asked, why did you keep on proclaiming Jesus? Then he said, we would rather obey God 
than men. And then they were all upset, all of them, whoa, they wanted to grab Peter, uh, Peter and John and they wanted to uh, put them into prison and have them executed. But a wise member of the Sanhedrin, Gamaliel, stood up and said, if it is of men, it will be stopped. But if it is of God, no one can stop them. No one can stop them. They are unstoppable. Why are they unstoppable? Because they proclaim the Lord Jesus. Why are you going to be unstoppable? Because you're going to proclaim the name of Jesus wherever you go. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise God because you are unstoppable because you give your testimony and you proclaim the Lord Jesus wherever you go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As it happened then, it shall happen now. Amen. And this testimony, Peter knows, underscores God's intervention in his life and gives glory to God. The brethren were amazed and they were encouraged. So will the people be around you when you do that and you testify about the Lord Jesus. I used to be shy about telling others about what God has done in my life. I used to think that it's boasting of what God done in my life. But that's not true. That's a lie that Satan plants in our minds to take away the glory from God because if you don't tell about what God has done, has intervened in your life, you do not give glory to God. Amen? In Revelation 12, verse 11, at the time when Satan was defeated, it is recorded, how did they defeat Satan? They defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and by their word of testimony, by the word of testimony. So when you go out and tell others of what Jesus has done in your life, you don't have to tell about what SIB has done, you don't have to tell what your pastor has done, you don't have to tell what your cell leader has done, but what Jesus has done in your life, you are proclaiming the Lord Jesus. And God will intervene miraculously setting captives free. Souls who are in captivity for years will be set free. The dark forces will be pushed back. Amen? Amen. Let me tell you a remarkable testimony. We late, I mean, this past few months, we're all talking about the connecting culture and we were talking about um, also coming for the prayer altars and we were praying and, and, and asking and encouraging each one to connect with one another. Little did I know that God has arranged a divine appointment for me with a stranger, a pre-believer who is, who is in her 60s of a different race and we were two continents apart. She coming from, she's an American Japanese lady that stayed in America and I was traveling from Malaysia to Hawaii and it was in the plane at 35,000 feet in the air that we connected. We were in, Jinai and I were traveling to Hawaii and we were in this plane with three seats. So we took two seats and there was an empty seat next to us. Now it's going to be a long haul flight we thought. Now, how many of you would like to start engaging a stranger on a long-haul flight? Not many, right? You don't know who you're talking to. For all you know, you have a chatterbox next to you for the next seven hours, you won't stop talking. <laughs> many of us hold back. But it must have been the Holy Spirit prompting that day that, that encourages us to start having a chat. And she was a very nice lady. So we got along, we chatted along, and then we found, she asked where, what we're doing, and we are, I told him that we are flying to there. Oh, she said, it's the same island we're going to. Hawaii has many islands, so she stays on Hawaii Island. So, but we are going to Kona, um, where the YWAM base is, and they are having this, this uh, dance, and YWAM dance and, and, and uh, outreach performance, dance and drama outreach performance, that we invited her to. But she stays in Hilo, which is about two hours' drive away. So she was rather reluctant to go. And then Jinai, being brave and bold, she said, oh, never mind, we get a car, we go over there two hours, we drive you back, drive you there two hours, and we send you back two hours. Wow, that's about the whole flight, actually, <laughs> six hours. Not knowing the terrain actually is up and down a hill and around corners with fog and everything. So she wisely said, no. Oh, we were a bit disappointed, but never mind. We, we still got to know each other. So at the end of the flight, we exchanged email and, and phone numbers and, and we parted. And then when we were in the YWAM base, we discovered not only is the dance and drama team performing, doing an outreach in Kona, but they're also doing an outreach in Hilo. Wow. So we got excited about it. So I wrote to her sent an email to her, you know, inviting her to come because we're going to a church in Hilo. And she, equally excited, replied and said, yes, I will certainly come to watch your daughter dance, you know. And, and, and she stayed half an hour out of Hilo. She said, I'll do a dry run. I'll go and drive my car to see where the church is first so that on the day I won't, be, I won't miss the performance. So the day came on a Sunday evening. She was one of the first to arrive. And we saw, saw the door. We were so ha happy and excited to see her. And we said the pleasantries and then we sat down. And then they dance, and then they, they, they presented a drama of the prodigal son in a dramatized form, a modern way. And as the dance and the drama went on, we were seated next to her, you could see just tears rolling down her eyes. 
And when at the end of the performance, the pastor gave an altar call. And she came forward for the altar call. Praise God for that. I give glory to God because God, in His wisdom, arranged for a divine appointment for two people, two continents apart, strangers of different races, 35,000 feet in the air. He connected us. So if God can do that, God can do for you in a coffee shop. God can do for you in your neighborhood. God can do for you in your workplace, anywhere. God can do for you. It is not by accident. It is by God's intervention. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's just marvelous. That's just marvelous, isn't it? But when we talk about God's intervention, we have this natural tendency to want to draw away from it. Because whenever there's any intervention, there is always change. And we don't like change. We are mainly comfortable, no matter how old or how young you are, that we just want change. But change happens in life, in creation. Look at a baby, you know, six months old and sucking a, a milk bottle. Oh, so cute, kuchi kuchi. You know, baby is so cute when it's six months old. Imagine 10 years later, the baby is still so small, sucking milk. Kuchi kuchi kuchi. No, it's not cute anymore 10 years later. Because change is necessary. The scripture says when you are young spiritually, you need spiritual milk. But when you grow up, you need meat. You need to change. You need to change your diet. You need to change your form as you grow. It's there. It's always there naturally. So change is needful. Change is needful. Yeah? All the more so, we need to have a spiritual change. We need to have a shift in the spiritual dimension all the time as we mature. So when God intervenes, it's a change, but it's always for your own good. It's always for your own good. Today, we realize how God intervenes in times of difficulty and what activates God's intervention. And what delights God in drawing Him to activate His intervention. It is earnest prayer, pursuit of Jesus, and proclamation of testimony. Repeat after me, earnest prayer, pursuit of Jesus, proclamation of testimony. That's just marvellous, isn't it? How God just delights and waits to intervene in our lives. Let me tell you another story. It's about a Cherokee Indian ritual. How a young Cherokee boy would need to go through to achieve manhood. By the way, a Cherokee is not a South Indian cigar, okay? It's a Native American tribe, Cherokee, right? When the Cherokee boy reaches the age of 16, the father will take the boy into the jungle and blindfolds him at night and leaves him there. He's not supposed to cry out for help. He's not supposed to move from the spot where the father leaves him, likely on a tree stump. And he's not supposed to take off the blindfold until the morning. And if he survives the night, he becomes a man. Naturally, the boy will be terrified. But he can't tell anybody of his experience because they tell him that in order for you to go through that, it's very unique to you. And you can't tell other lads because each one, each boy must come into manhood in his own form, in his own way, in his own right. So when he's placed there, in the middle of the night, the terror begins to set in. His imagination begins to go wild. He hears noises all around. And there will sound a beast even in a jungle, in the jungle, not just a little beluka bush, but in the jungle, you hear roaring of, 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 of wild animals. You hear strange noises. Perhaps even a human might come in to harm him. Oh, he can't cry out, he can't move. And then you hear the winds rustling the trees and the grass. And then even the tree stump he sits on might be shaking, but he can't cry out for help. But he would sit there quietly, stoically, because that's the only way he could become a man. Finally, the horrific night is over. The rays of the sun comes in the morning. And as the rays of the sun goes through his blindfold, he takes up his blindfold. And then he realizes his father has been nearby, watching over him throughout the whole night, intervening in case harm comes to him. On one hand, the father would want to tell the son he's there, to assure him. But on the other hand, he restrains himself from intervening because he knows that if he does so, the boy would not be able to attain his next level of maturity. We too are never alone. 
even when we don't know it, our Heavenly Father is watching us, keeping watch and intervening when necessary to keep us from harm. Our senses fail to tell us many times, but God and His host of angels have protected us from harm in more ways than we know it. God has always been there. You too will have to trust God. We'll have to trust until the morning comes, until the darkness is over. Then the veil will be removed and you begin to see the glory of God's intervention in your life. That's what faith is about. Amen? So when God intervenes, it's always for good. Our Heavenly Father is just waiting, waiting to intervene if you would allow Him to. Interventions by the Heavenly Father is always for good. Like Peter, who allowed God to intervene in his life, to prepare him for a life of ministry ahead, God took him step by step when Peter did that. Like Lou Engel, who gave up all that he had for God to use mightily when God intervened in the Azusa Now event. You must hunger for it. You must want it. You must pursue it. Amen? Amen. You must want it for yourself. It begins with the heart. It begins with the heart. You have to wholeheartedly pursue God like Peter did. So as we close, I'm going to open the altar. When one thing closes, another thing opens. Some of you are in here because you are in some form of captivity. It could be a personal sickness, it could be a financial crisis, it could be an addiction that you had over the years that you've been struggling with, it could be a family issue, a personal issue, but you feel that the Lord has touched you this morning and you want to say, yes, yes, Lord Jesus, I know you're standing there all this while and I know that when you lay your hand on my life, going to be a marvellous transformation. I want to have your touch upon me. I want to encourage you to come forward. Come forward to the altar as we open the altar and we sing our closing song. Perhaps you have not known the Lord Jesus all this while. You have heard about the Lord Jesus, but you walked into this hall at the invitation of a friend this morning, or you walked in by yourself, but you have never developed a relationship with the Lord all this while. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now if you feel a tug in your heart. There are treasures that you hold on very tightly in this world. But when you find the treasure, the joy and the intimacy of knowing God, you know that it's a treasure far greater than any treasure in this earth. And you'll be willing to sell all you have to buy that field. I don't mean literally, but it's just comparison. Like the lady that I met 35,000 feet in the air, it was no accident, it was by divine appointment. That when your friend invited you, or when you walked into this hall this morning, it is by, not by accident, it's a divine appointment that the Lord has created for you to come before Him. And now He's offering you an invitation to come forward. This is your chance to know the Lord personally glorious Saviour who said that the Spirit of the mighty God, the mighty Lord is upon me, that I have come to set captives free. And today, He will come to set you free from your captivity. Amen? Amen. Let's all around.